Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm so sorry that Mohammed isn't here because I was hoping for another taster and see how things go with Freedom Pizza. Um, I'm one of those people who've been in Dubai now for 15 years. I remember Wild Pizza the first time round. Uh, and in fact, in the early years of We Will Fix It, Wild Pizza was pretty much what sustained us. So I am as disappointed as you are that Mohammed is not here. So 8.06 last night, the message comes, Colin, I'm in trouble, and no, it's not a leak in my water heater, which is what is normally the conversation with, uh, with James. Um, the good news is I'm not here to talk about maintenance. However, if any of you do have an, a block toilet, I'm your man. Not something I thought that I'd be saying 20 years ago at the start of my career. Um, but again, the whole idea is being eclectic these days. So then the kind of conversation went, well, what, what is Preserve? So he sent me the link to the site. And the way that it seems that it, it's looked at here is very much from an environmental perspective. Well, I'm really sorry I'm not an environmentalist, <laughs> if the truth be told. I'm an accidental environmentalist quite recently, um, which is a, a story I'll get to later. But for me, environmentalism needs to come alongside um, financial acumen. And I believe the only way that environmentalism will work is uh, with business very much alongside. Um, so probably going down that route wasn't the way that I was going to go. So I then thought about preserve. What is it that I associate with that word preserve? And the first thing that came to mind was sanity, preserving your sanity. People talk about this, and it's something, uh, obviously, mental health is a hell of a subject now. And I've been really lucky in that respect, or at least I thought I had when I first thought about, OK, well, preserving my sanity, when has that actually been tested? And then I kind of started going back through the career that I've had and realized just how many times that has been tested and kind of the reaction that I had to that. Now, 20 years ago, we didn't really talk about mental health and something that you would preserve. It was that guy who's having a bit of a moment in the office and, oh my God, is he gonna get over this soon? And I had all of those moments uh, without a doubt. So in terms of, um, in terms of that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, about that tenacity and the sanity preservation as well. Another thing that for me is an absolute key fundamental and something probably as a father that I've thought about more and more is preserving honesty. It's something that everybody likes to talk about. Oh yes, I'm fundamentally honest. But again, until that's really tested, and Dubai tests that in so many different ways day to day, that to be fundamentally honest and being prepared to preserve that in every aspect of your life is something that really for me came very much in focus, not just with marriage, but when you have kids and you have people that you are trying to set an example to in everything that you do. So I'm going to talk about that um, throughout as well. And the final bit of preserve is actually based on a stat that I got from Lloyds Bank when I first went in there with my business plan in June 2008, which was, are you aware that statistics say you will have failed in three years? Okay. But when you're just starting up a business, that's a really sobering thought because I didn't have a plan B. I'd already quit my corporate life at Sony and therefore I was all in, absolutely all in. The lovely thing is after three years, my phenomenal relationship manager said, well, you know what? You've beaten the statistic that there aren't many companies that make it to 10. <laughs> well, we're now at 11 and a half and I'm pleased to say we're not even on the brink we're always close to it because we try and push our limits as far as we can possibly go. So again, going back to sanity, it's a different type of sanity, really, that we try to preserve these days rather than the good old days. So I'm going to try and give you a bit of an abridged history of how I ended up, well, first of all, in Dubai, but also kind of where we are right now. And the great thing about being self-employed is that you can be brutally honest. So this is really a, a tale of underachievement and uh, perseverance as well. So I was born, actually, um, my father was a fast jet pilot. My mother was an air traffic controller. The romantic story goes that um, apparently my father had a malfunction on a fast jet and my mother was on the, um, uh, was on the radio to try and talk him down. Um, and this is the story that they told the BBC who thought what a romantic story that they got married 11 months later. 
And I've heard that, and my mum sounds just like the Queen, my father sounds like Prince Philip. Um, and it turns out it was complete rubbish. It was all <laughs> dictated by the Royal Air Force that they were told their story that they needed to give and the reason that they were together, but it was an absolute fabrication. <laughs> a great illustration of PR. At the time, they needed a real recruitment drive to get people into the Royal Air Force in, uh, in the UK. However, the Royal Air Force wasn't too bothered by honesty, and at the time, my parents went along with it. We often talk about that as a role model moment, and that, that dishonesty really is what kind of has formed our, uh, the start of our life. So with my father, we moved from the south of England to the north of England. And the north of England, the area that we're from, is uh, really well known for never having sunshine. It's always foggy. It's always raining. And the people are about as bright in terms of their outlook as the weather. So it's something that I always wanted to escape from. And for me, Dubai is where I've escaped to. And this is my happy place, without a doubt. I am not the type of Brit that is desperate to go back home. In fact, I haven't visited in four years. I'm going to have to go this year. And I'm dreading it. And the simple reason is it's full of that mentality. And it's not something that I appreciate at all. It's always somebody else's fault. It's Europe's fault, Brexit. I'm unemployed. The council hasn't given me a job. That, for me, is the worst of a British mentality. And for me, perseverance and Dubai is all about, if this doesn't work out, I'm out of here in 30 days. So I've got to make this work. And that's very much the way that, um, that I like to approach life, actually, these days. So school was an odd situation. Um, I went to a, um, an expensive private school um, that my parents couldn't afford, but were determined that I would go to. And I turned up there. I, I still don't know for sure whether I really did fail the exam to get in, and my dad taught me in there. But what was very clear when I was eight years old was I was well and truly bottom of the class. And not in the bottom third, as people like to talk about, I was bottom of the class. And I stayed there for a number of years. When you're in an all-boys school with very, very smart individuals, that means that you are teased mercilessly. And as that kind of progresses, these days they would call it bullying and there'd be a, a teacher who would manage that whole process. But for me, it was very much about me managing that process. And to be honest, my father then teaching me to fight. <laughs> The wonders, the wonders of um, uh, puberty meant that all of a sudden I ended up at this size at 12. And uh, bizarrely, at that point, people didn't want to fight me anymore. So things kind of changed. School life is an interesting one. I think these days um, it is more of a, uh, a wider path than it was uh, back in those days. Um, interestingly enough, we had craft design technology, which bizarrely is kind of where I am now. Um, but it was very much the kind of um, areas of maths and science that were of interest. Interestingly enough, though, I managed to get an E in my maths A-level, yet that, bizarrely, has been the most useful of any of the A-level work that I did. I went to, uh, to university at what um, is now Manchester Metropolitan University, then was uh, Manchester Polytechnic. And um, actually, thanks to the rest of my grades, I could have gone pretty much to any of the choices that I had. So the conversation was, why would you go to a polytechnic, which in the UK is very much frowned upon? You're not going to a university, you're going to a polytechnic. And the reason was simple, which was their approach to business was very much about looking at it from the inside, ignoring the, um, the theoretical approach, and instead very much about immersing you within that kind of culture. Which when you're a precocious 18, 19 year old is very dangerous for any business that you're put into. First business I went into uh, was a company called Turtle Wax. I don't know whether you know the car products that you um, wax products and all this kind of thing. Well, within a week, I was in front of the operations director and um, shouting my mouth off about this is this is not the way you do it. I've learned at my university that we do it this way. And I didn't understand that really within a work environment, the idea of perseverance is very, very different to my own approach, which was stick to your ideals, believe in what you know, and onwards we go. So that came as a, as a rude awakening and a real shock. 
interestingly enough, that job didn't go particularly well. So I, I finished my placement there, and I think the feedback that went back to the university was, oh my God, you've got a right individual on your hands here. And they were absolutely right. But the other side of that was what I took out of it and what I was required to do as part of my course was to basically do an, an assessment on myself for the year that I'd spent there were I to be writing it on behalf of the company. So I actually had to write the report that basically said, Colin has been pretty much an abusive failure over this year. We are sure he's learned a lot, but we're not sure that we want somebody back for the next year. And unfortunately, that proved to be the case. So uh, that was one more placement that was ruined by the university. You might work out a bit of a theme here, which is I fully intend to be self-employed for the rest of my life. And on that basis, I'm not going to try and blow my own trumpet here on the failures that have occurred, which I think is quite important. And we also talked about honesty, didn't we? So I'm going to try and aim in that kind of direction. So university was finished. Bizarrely, um, the results turned out quite well. And um, off to the world of work. Um, Kraft Foods, who are now Mondelez, um, if you, I'm guessing you, you know these guys, um, at the time were looking for people who were a little bit more sparky than their tradition. And uh, the tradition of FMCG is very much, um, I think still now as much as it, it was then, um, that they are looking for an individual to fit a role and bring uh, all of the culture from the company and impregnate the individual with their culture. So with uh, Kraft Foods as it was then, um, there was a book that was given to me of three letter acronyms for all of the, um, their Americanisms that I had no understanding. There was a corporate laugh that was shared within a meeting between individuals <laughs> And it was almost like a, a bizarre joining call that I was not ever going to be a member of, uh, without a doubt. In those days, HR were uh, a difficult outfit to deal with, and we had none of the rules and regulations that we have now. So after two weeks, I was called into the HR manager's office to say, you have a northern accent, an accent from the north of England, and people think you're stupid. Therefore, we would like you to change your accent. You wouldn't be able to do that now. And at the time, my outtake was purely, OK, so to get on within this company, they want me to change my accent. So I'll change my accent. And now what you have is something that normally for British people, they can't tell where in the country I'm from. <laughs> and it's odd, because when I go back to my hometown, I'm absolutely back into my northern dialect. When I go down to London, it's tuned for that. And if you think about. Um, personal marketing, which we all have to do, we are all marketeers whether we like it or not, then that is something that we are doing daily without really thinking about it. But these days, an HR department can't talk to you about it. So Kraft Foods was an odd one. What they said they wanted and what they actually wanted were two different things. And what they actually got was a square peg and a round hole. And again, after my one year fixed contract was completed, they were over the moon that I was going. Uh, oddly enough, that wasn't quite my feeling. I was holding on to that one for dear life. I had good friends there. They were amazing brands. We were looking, um, we did the relaunch at that stage of uh, Dairy Lee. Um, I was personally looking after an English brand uh, called Angel Delight. Um, but the best bit of all was on Wednesday mornings at 8.05, I sat on the Toblerone tasting panel where we literally used to have food technicians with 12 different versions of Toblerone saying, I need you to taste each one carefully and give me your considered opinion based on these 12 elements. I got very, very fat, but it was very, very enjoyable. Every minute of it was wonderful. And again, these tasting panels were a real oddity because we used to do four every week for the different brands. And we literally shaped a lot of really what is now being consumed and the new brands that have been established ever since. Oddly enough, in those days as well, they were allowed to do some really horrific things. For instance, the red color that was in Angel Delight came from Carmine at that stage, which was crushed bark beetles. But um, we changed it in, um, in that year. And one of the projects that I did was to change that over to beetroot, which is the red color that you're all using now. So oddly enough, that was how things were in those days. 
So bizarrely enough, I was unemployed after, um, after the days at, um, at Kraft Foods. And um, that's probably where the kind of concepts of both um, uh, perseverance and self-preservation um, really kicked in. Um, I was unemployed for nine months, living at my parents' home yet again, back in Preston, where it always rains and it's always foggy. And um, certainly at that stage, I can now realize that my mental health was not in a great place. I guess that concept of self-worth is something that we don't really talk about on a personal level, but it was definitely extremely compromised at, at, at this period. Then out of the blue, PlayStation came along, and the oddity of how that kind of happened was um, PlayStation at that stage was as hot as it got. Um, they were the absolute rock stars of the, uh, of the industries, um, and I didn't think I had a hope in hell. The reason was simple, which was I'd never ever played PlayStation before. Um, so I hadn't seen it, I hadn't played it, I had no clue. I played on a ZX Spectrum when I was seven, and that was the only relevant experience that I could see for why PlayStation would want to talk to me. So I got about a three week notice period of the first interview uh, at the time. And luckily one of my best friends, still my best friend, was unemployed as well. And what he did with his time was he played PlayStation all day. So at that point, what we decided to do was I get him to teach me PlayStation, but as if it was a job. So we started at 8 o'clock every morning, and we played PlayStation till 10 o'clock every night. But I kind of realized that if we played one game, he was really into ISS soccer at the time. Okay? And I understood that if I played that one game, not only within a three-week period playing for 14 hours a day would I be brilliant at ISS, but it's highly unlikely that PlayStation is just going to ask me about ISS. So instead, what we did was we raided the bargain bins of the local shops for every and any PlayStation game because I wanted to create a broad experience of knowledge in a very short period. Okay. I also thought that they would be more interested in knowing about those products that Sony themselves launched rather than the third parties. So I looked for Sony Computer Entertainment Europe products and literally focused on those as being the kind of approach that we would go. And boy, did they launch some absolutely terrible games. They were awful. But that was really the bread and butter. So interestingly enough, the morning before the, uh, the interview, I got the phone call from Michael Page, and they said, no pressure, but 2,500 have applied for this job. So at that moment, I was, I was really... I didn't think I had a hope, but I thought, well, you know, I put this body of work, as far as I was concerned, playing PlayStation in, so let's see how we go here. So I went in for my, um, for my first interview, went absolutely fine. A lovely lady who, was, um, who, uh, uh, who just gave me an absolute standard interview, but she warned me, your next interview is with a gentleman called David Patton, and he's a bit of a difficult character. So I knew on my first interview I had the second one going. And um, at that point, I was kind of a difficult character, 2,500 people. I really don't have anything to, um, uh, or any expectation of this role. But I was absolutely adamant that I would put everything into it at that stage. So I then went, OK, what did I learn from that first interview? Well, first of all, I've learned that A, I got through it. So therefore, I don't have to be a hardcore um, PlayStation buff. Secondly, they must like that FMCG background. Thirdly, they're the coolest brand going right now with the PlayStation generation, and that is a generation I know absolutely nothing about. And I've got three weeks. So at that point, it went to seven days, uh, seven days a week, 14 hours a day of focusing on those elements to be ready for that next interview. And I was as prepared as I could possibly imagine to be able to do that. When I walked into the interview, the first question that I, I received from David Patton was, why the F do you think you can market PlayStation when all you've ever done is sell S to kids? And that was his opening line. He didn't even say, good morning, how are you? I hope you arrived okay. That was his opening line. In future years, I brought this up with him and asked him, why, why, why did you think that that was the route that you were, you were going to go down? And he said, this job is all about perseverance and resilience. And what I needed to know off the bat was, when I threw you, what would your reaction be? And it's odd, because I guess now that whole, um, the whole cliched questions at, um, at interview are very much what we all prepare for. But in those days, that very much wasn't the case. So at that time, 
eventually the job came and um, uh, we were a group of 10 at PlayStation Europe uh, responsible for some of the biggest brands in the world at the time. Um, I arrived in 2000, just before the launch of PlayStation 2. And uh, it was also at the same time that PlayStation realized that they had a massive drug problem within their marketing team. These were guys who had been considered the rock stars of their era within the marketing, uh, the marketing environment. Some of you may remember that early creative that was done for PlayStation, uh, which at the time just was an absolute revolution. And that was mainly fueled by cocaine. What happened when I arrived was I was their experiment. I was their first non-gamer with a marketing team of 10. Um, I was their, one of their few clean guys. I've never uh, touched drugs in my life. And they wanted to work out whether or not they could tradition, uh, uh, transition the brand from their heartland, which was very much the hardcore gamer, into what's now considered social gaming. So they very much had the intention that it would not be a gamer that was going to be coming in, but what they wanted was somebody with a solid track record in fast-moving consumer goods. I didn't tell them that my previous two experiences hadn't been wholeheartedly successful, and that risk came. Uh, within six months, we'd launched uh, PlayStation 2. Three out of those five titles I launched um, myself uh, for the European market. Um, and at that stage, they sent me off on my first trip to Japan. We were really stretched at that stage, so the way it actually went was, here's a check for $25 million. If you get this tick list of agreements from Sega, give them the check for $25 million. I'd never been to Japan before. Um, I don't speak Japanese, um, and I sure as hell had never had a check for anything more than about 100 pounds. So 25 million was a bit of an odd one. The deal was quite simple, which was, at that stage, the Sega Dreamcast was just dying out, and the idea was, can we transition them onto PlayStation instead of Nintendo? And really, the aim uh, that we had there was, whoever gets the content, gets the customer, gets the sale, has the success. Okay? The good news for PlayStation 2 was, that was all secured. We had Sonic the Hedgehog on our platform, which was critical for us, and that critical mass uh, was very much achieved. But in terms of that trip, it was harrowing, to say the least. The Japanese culture, for somebody who has not um, experienced it before, is very much one of trial. How far can we push this guy before he will crack? So what that kind of meant was, from the moment that I arrived at Narita, the meeting started I had a lady who I, I called Bolton. She was Japanese, but had been living in Manchester for quite a while before she'd returned to Tokyo. And she was there to be my liaison, but luckily she never left me. She was right here at that time. So she could translate whatever I was doing, which was a mixture of Northern with a very posh accent, actually now living in London, into Japanese. And I would be told when I needed to bow, I would be told exactly what I needed to be done in a very northern way so that our Japanese hosts who did speak quite good English would not understand it. Um, in terms of preservation and perseverance, that was really where it, it came to. It took me three days to get that checklist done in a meeting that was supposed to last for about four hours. But what I found with the Japanese was that the man that I needed to speak to was at the opposite end of the table and it was hierarchically based from the person that I spoke to as the one representative to our company and it went all the way down the table to the guy at the end who had the information that I needed, and then all the way back to be able to get that one bit of information. So it was literally to get what I would normally do in a meeting in an hour and a half was a day, a day and a half of absolutely solid meetings to do. Um, something that I've learned more about, and we all experience here in, um, in Dubai, is culture. And one of the worst things about being British is we're not very good with culture at all. You know, it, it, for me, the concept of Brexit, the fact we all want to leave this most wonderful institution that is Europe, is the absolute epitome of that. And I'm not proud of it in the slightest. So over the years at, um, at uh, PlayStation, I got to the stage where, um, luckily, I had various promotions. I was the head of motorsport. I absolutely adore cars. And um, I got my absolute dream job. Um, so we were running um, the, one of the biggest games in the world called Gran Turismo at that time. 
Uh, we had licenses for Formula One, we had licenses for World Rally, and I spent my life on a plane going to World Rally one weekend, Formula One the next weekend, off to a car event and then back again. It was wonderful. And then five and a half years had passed and um, I got to the stage where I lived in three suitcases. I didn't even unpack. I handed the suitcase to uh, the dry cleaners and they gave me my next suitcase back to walk off with. We had this wonderful arrangement and then I didn't really have to do very much to do it. But I also realized that not only had I been working seven day weeks for five and a half years, but I was pretty much um, emotionally bereft of any kind of feeling that was non-PlayStation related, I became an incredibly boring individual to have over for dinner because my topic of conversation was PlayStation. That was it, because that's what I did. That's kind of painful for um, somebody to tell you. And at the time, my sister had moved into my apartment in Docklands and she told me really bluntly, and it, it's a horrendous thing to hear, You've turned into an extremely boring individual because you've messed up your work-life balance. And it was at that moment, luckily, that the Dubai opportunity came along. So I moved to Dubai um, to head up the marketing team for, uh, for PlayStation uh, at the time when we were taking the brand back from Jumbo Electronics and um, the, uh, the idea was that we would run it ourselves. Um, there were three of us that were, that were running it uh, at the time. Um, and uh, the oddest thing was we were used to running a business with sort of four to 500 people of backing and there were three of us and a, a bunch of local people that were there, but, but nothing really more than that. What we learned very quickly was we needed an entrepreneurial approach to it and to uh, very much focus on what it was that made us us. Um, Irrespective of our abilities, we had the most ridiculous storm of wonderment that happened in the Middle East where everybody found out about what PlayStation was all at the same time. We had the most ridiculous sales that went through the roof. I thought it was all down to my wonderful marketing. And we all of a sudden had these enormous budgets that were coming our way because we were the absolute shining star of any market around the world. We even brought Shakira here. For any of you that were here in 2007, 2008, um, we launched PlayStation 3, Shakira came, we got Motor City for the biggest event that we'd ever done in the history of Dubai at the time. It was 33,000 people. We had no infrastructure. The road into Motor City wasn't there. So the queue of people went right the way through Sheikh Zayed Road and kept on going as Shakira was playing very happily on the main stage. And we got slated for it. It was absolutely awful from that perspective, but wonderful for the brand. <laughs> so again, success, but maybe not. Um, one day about, uh, oh, it must have been about six months after that, I, uh, I went into the office and I realized that I wasn't gonna do this anymore. And the odd thing was I absolutely loved what I was doing, but I realized that in 10 years time, I was gonna be sat there with my boss and we were gonna be doing exactly the same thing. And I was quite clear that probably going back to the conversation with my sister, that we needed to do something very different. So that's where We Will Fix It came along. Or in those days, Jim will fix it. Okay? Now, who's Jim? This is a difficult conversation to have because in 2012, the whole reference scenario changed. And I will talk a little bit about that. Luckily, I think some of you know what I'm talking about. I'll explain it for others. Okay? So in 2008, um, I was looking for a name for this new business that we'd literally written on the back of a, um, uh, the back of a napkin at the Lakes Club with my, uh, my business partner. And I wanted something that was personal uh, to me that would very much um, uh, work with our British audience and um, uh, would have some kind of resonance uh, for what we were doing. My full name is Colin Donald James Thomas. Colin will fix it, didn't work. Donald will fix it, didn't work. Jim will fix it. Jim will fix it. We used to watch that as kids. It's a television program in England that was all about a certain individual um, called Jimmy Savile, whose job it was to make um, children's dreams come true. And in 2008, that is exactly how it was perceived. So I was like, well, Jim will fix it. That's those guys. If we went with Jim will fix it, then I can own that as a brand. And branding for me, very much my useless career, 
had been about branding. So the one bit that I did know about was branding. And I was very, very adamant about the way that would be managed, and I still am to this day. So Jim will fix it. Great, we own that. We've got the, um, the, the uh, .ae, we've got the .com, I've got that as our space. We can abridge four years, I think, at this stage, which is basically the standard startup story of we almost went out of business weekly. And luckily, due to my sister, again, bless her cotton socks, who is a certified accountant, who saved us three days before we went bankrupt. Um, I didn't realize that we were totally out of cash flow. She did. And for anyone who's starting a business, please employ an accountant. Don't employ anyone else, employ an accountant. I was told that before I started. I ignored that. It was the wrong decision. Um, so 2012 comes. The first thing that I heard about um, uh, Jimmy Savile was a phone call that came from uh, a guy called Simon Smedley. Um, you might know him as Catboy um, on the radio. He's a good friend of mine. You know Catboy from Dubai 92? Right, OK. So he was a good friend of mine. He gave me a phone call and said, have you heard about Jimmy Savile? I'm like, no, what? He said, you need to check out very quickly about what's happening right now about Jimmy Savile. And the story had just broken that uh, he died um, uh, quite recently at that time. The story broke that he was, at that stage, a suspected uh, paedophile um, of epic proportions. In fact, he is now considered one of the uh, worst offenders uh, in the whole of British history. So at this moment, I'm, I'm literally just beating my head against the desk going, I, I, this is the perfect storm of the worst possible scenario um, that I could have as a business owner within a fledgling um, situation. How do I preserve my business? Whew, got that one in there. Um, OK, so the phone calls started coming. And the phone calls were, you must be having a total nightmare. Can I book a 4AC service, please? More phone calls were coming. Oh my goodness, am I the only person who's called you today? Can I have an 8AC service? And the phone calls kept coming and kept coming and we were tracking them at the time and all of a sudden my volumes are going up higher and higher and we're waiting for abuse. We thought, right, we're really gonna get it here. And it did come, but it came four times in the space of a six month period. And it was from people who'd had personal experience of abuse and felt that our piggying off the back of the Jim will fix it brand was about as distasteful as it gets and they had a point but the actual core elements of why we were named that way it wasn't the core the core was I wanted something that was about me that had a cachet for my audience okay the other issue was we were calculating at this time what's the cost of a rebrand and the answer came back at quarter of a million well, at the time, my bank account was about 20,000, and that was it. So I couldn't afford to rebrand. So we stuck with it. We stuck with that brand. And then we went live on air with Catboy, um, who promised his bosses at uh, uh, the Arabian Radio Network that we're going to go and discuss this live on air, and they were all for it. So we started that discussion, which was, does Jim Will Fix It need to rebrand? And the whole conversation got cut very, very quickly by one message that came in that we couldn't read out in full that said, for goodness sake, why are you even discussing this? We can tell the difference between a maintenance co uh, company and a paedophile. And that was that angle that people had, which was we'd worked so hard for four years to create something that was unique to us uh, within Dubai. And people, whilst they found it, distasteful in certain elements, didn't feel that it was something that desperately needed to be changed because we we're treating people like idiots if we did change it. However, we did change it, not at that time, but when we could afford to do it. And that actually only happened um, two and a half years ago. And our reason for that was, uh, was quite simple. We started to get some school contracts. And at that point, to then have that marriage of Jim will fix it within a school environment was just too much of a risk. We were all ready to go. I'd spent 247,000, and the last thing that I needed was the dot com. Wonderful, great, just need a dot com. That's gonna be easy enough. Let's find this dot com. So in we types, who is, who owns it? A little IT shop in uh, Watford uh, in North London owned it. 
and um, they owned it for We Will Fix IT. <laughs> oh God, how are we going to deal with this? So I sent them an email. Hello, what a wonderful company you have. I'm sure you could call it many other things. And on that basis, for a couple of hundred pounds, I'm sure you would want to sell your, um, your .com to me. And he came back, wonderful to hear from you. Yes, I would be very interested in selling um, the, uh, the .com for $125,000. OK. At this point, there was a, it was really interesting because there was the conversation about whether or not we go with the .ae, which we already had, or alternatively, we needed that .com. And I'm sure all of you have dealt with this kind of issue. And where it boiled down to was we wanted to keep options open for where we to franchise or expand in the future. And to go through the individual process, we knew that anyone that approached us for franchising would already own their individual domain of the We Will Fix It name for their local country. So that wasn't going to work. So I needed that .com one way or the other. Now, this is the bit where it all goes a little bit gray because we contacted um, a company that specializes in this in the US. And we said, we have a problem. We will pay you to fix it. But this is what we know. Radio silence for six weeks. And at that point, there you go, $5,000. We don't know what they did. We don't know whether or not we will fix it. IT people are still on this planet. But we fixed the problem. So we now own that .com. It will never be going anywhere. Okay, But again, when we're thinking about um, the concepts of, uh, of perseverance, that, again, is something that's really key. We can kind of probably forward to, to now. Where are we at now? So we're currently a team of, actually, we're a bit bigger than that now. Uh, so we're a team of somewhere between 90 and 100. Um, we have a British management team and an all-Filipino workforce. We do somewhere between 120 and 150 jobs every day. Um, and... Uh, what makes us different? Why are we any different to all the other people that will unblock your toilet? Well, first things first, we will do it with a smile. We'll warranty everything that we do. Um, and we want that experience to be what people would expect, which is quality from the first moment they contact us to the moment 12 months later when they're out of warranty. And that is what we provide every single time. It's a point of difference even now. But it's amazing when you look at that whole consumer experience and what people are dealing with, how many people fall down either at that first step or at the last step of a warranty? And what we're doing is very much tying it right from that moment of, um, of a thought, which is toilet blockage, right the way through to 12 months later, my toilet's still unblocked and we're good. I talk about the most unglamorous service, but we do have much more glamorous than that, but I'm not even going to get into AC. So these days, these days, um, I've handed over the majority of the running of the business. We have a, a management team that's in place. Um, I work a couple of days a week. And the reason for that is simple. I have two small kids. And my aim when we started up Jim Will Fix It was always to be at the stage whereby I had the choice whether or not I would work within the environment of, um, of my business. Or alternatively, I could spend time to see my kids grow up. And uh, it is the best thing ever. For those of you who are wondering about self-employment, that's the best bit by far. Oh, God, really? Did that one get me? <laughs> ah, OK. Go for it. So now it. I've got a, thank you, <laughs> needed that. Um, so now I've got a seven-year-old and, uh, seven and a four-year-old, and I'll be taking them to swimming lessons this afternoon. Um, they both have health issues that we deal with on a, on a regular basis, but I'm there to be able to help. And that's a choice that uh, I made a long time ago. So for me, that's the best payoff for a self-employed life. And I'm sorry we're not eating pizzas right now, but very much that's me. But again, if you do have any questions whatsoever, then do let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Come down, get me. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> Comments, questions, something on your mind? Hi. Hi. Yes. And all of that. So two things. Can you like tell us about what age you were at? Yep. Because I couldn't like understand the timeline. Yes, I would have and been 22, 23 at that stage, I think. Okay. And yeah. can you like talk about that a little bit more? Yes. Of, like, I mean, how do you think it was different than 
another 20 23 year old today who's unemployed going through that same stuff like could you maybe give us a parallel of sure talk about it? yeah yeah um i don't think i can i can find you that um uh that connection to a modern day 22 or 23 year old because i'm now 43 so that's not really an era that i can tell you about i would have thought it's very similar the concept goes, it's a matter of self-worth. So you've had a company that has just rejected you and said, I'm really sorry, but you're not good enough to continue working in our company. At that same time, you lose your independence because you're no longer in an environment whereby you can support yourself. And therefore, luckily, I had a safety net, an incredible safe net at that with my parents. And my parents were determined to give me as much space as they possibly could. There was no discussion about, um, uh, you wake up at this time, you're gonna do this. All that I had was the most wonderful environment of them saying, um, this is your space, this will always be your home, and therefore, whenever you need it, you've got it, which is lovely. But the problem is, your mind is telling you, I'm not worthy because I'm not wanted anymore for work. Secondly, what do I actually do with my days? Practically speaking, what am I doing on a day-to-day -day basis when I don't have um, uh, employment, I don't have somebody who's prepared to pay me money for that, and what does that look like? And that, for me, was where it kind of all started to very much close in. Luckily enough, I didn't get probably to the depths that many people have been through in that environment, but it was extremely painful. And what I actually did was, quite similar to the way that I dealt with um, PlayStation, I made finding a job my job. So every morning was structured. So I'd be up at eight o'clock, breakfast until nine. Nine o'clock, I would start on the first part of research of companies that um, that I could be employed by. I then um, kind of looked at enrichment. So what do I actually do to improve my own mental health? I cycle, I never cycle, I cycle. And um, it was literally um, very much an aim to just try and actively elevate um, myself in, in different ways. Thank you. Hi. Ah, um, I actually said um, good. I actually said good morning, David. My name's Colin. It's so nice to meet you. <laughs> and if I can sell shit to kids, then I can sure as hell sell PlayStations. <laughs> Interestingly enough, that gentleman, David Patton, is now the global president for Young and Rubicon. Um, previously, the global president of uh, Gray, um, but uh, he's an incredible individual. Interestingly enough. Um, Another abridged part that I didn't talk about was um, at the time when we were doing motorsport, um, I was managing a, a racing driver on the side. PlayStation used to let you have other projects, which is genius, because what it meant was we came to PlayStation really, really fresh with lots of other things that we were all doing at the same time. We had zero hour contracts before zero hour contracts were a thing, and it basically meant that, that we would get paid the same, but we opted in. Whenever we went in, we didn't have a time that we needed to be in the office. We didn't have a time we needed to leave the office. We did what was required. So there's a racing driver that these days is quite well known. His name's Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> Heard of him? Okay, well, I managed him for a period at this time when he was in his um, Formula 3 days. Brought him to, to David and said, David, I've got the perfect guy for our Formula 1 game. Yeah, but he's not in Formula 1. Yeah, I know David is not in Formula 1, but he's going to be, and he's going to be huge. Colin, are you absolutely sure about this? I am 100% sure he's going to be incredible. But I need some money. How much do you need? Half a million, please, David. He's like, no, go away. Stop being so bloody ridiculous. Anyway, every time I see David now, we talk about Lewis Hamilton and what an error that was. <laughs> but it happens. Mm. Yeah, to be fair, the bit that I paid for myself was in Macau in um, European Formula 3. He totaled his car on the first lap into a, a wall, and I personally had to pay for the rebuild, so I didn't do very well out of it, to be fair. But, you know, at that time in my career, that's pretty much where it was. Hello. Uh, so what is next? What is next? Uh, for me? Yeah. Okay. Um, great question. There's a couple of different things that we're working on. Um, a year and a half ago, we set up another brand called Essential Maintenance, uh, which is basically an annual maintenance business. Sounds very simple, but it's, it's really not, because if you're trying to deliver what we deliver on an individual job basis, 24-7, 365, it takes a whole different infrastructure. So it's the things like we started off, I booked myself and my business partner, booked the first 28,000 jobs ourselves, personally on the phone. 
So to be able to replicate that, we have a group of British tradesmen who now take your call when you, you ring our number. So that was the initial step that we took. And then we had to take the step to, OK, how do we do that 24-7, 365? And we have. There is always somebody who, you, um, who speaks English as a first language available for you there. So that's been the last project. Interestingly enough, I've spent some time in Nest trying to work out what the next project is. I'm always working out what the next project is, and at any time, I will start with probably 50 ideas. I'll bring down probably four that go through to concept, and one that goes through to that initial um, testing phase. Um, we had a, a concept that got through to that initial one uh, about three to four months ago, and then failed. So we didn't launch it. We have a really defined process now that we go through for uh, prototyping. Um, and it failed at that last hurdle, and I'm really glad that it did, because it wouldn't have made money. The thing that, if I can, if any of you are thinking about starting businesses, probably the first thing that I have to say to you is, you will always get the supply side right, because that's the bit that you know about. You will never get the demand side right, unless you research the arse out of it. There is no such thing as enough research. And these days, people look at We Will Fix It and go, oh, you work two days a week. You're so lucky. And I get that twice a week. And at that point, I'm ready to punch somebody. <laughs> there was no luck involved. We worked really, really hard. We employed some really good people. And now, thank goodness, the benefits are coming through. So next steps, yes, there will be something. I don't have anything in my mind right now. Um, but there will be something. I will spend more time probably in Nest working that out. Hi. Okay, uh, I became self-employed at 31, I think. Yeah. Uh, so as you became self-employed, how did you have one day? I think, uh, I'm self-employed, so I'm in my early 20s. And um, the quality is something that I struggle with a lot. Okay. What would your advice be to entrepreneurs to you? Because we're living in a day, an age of productivity. And like, you know, there's so much of productivity hacks and advice and so much yeah. so around. Yes. So, as a budding entrepreneur, as a new entrepreneur, or someone who's self-employed, how did you sort of like, you know, create that create that accountability for yourself, yeah. and and kind of show that accountability? That yes. Yeah. Autonomy is something that people don't talk about enough. Yeah. Would you say autonomy or isolation? Both. Actually. Okay. Both. I yeah. know that they're not they're not the same thing, but autonomy with isolation can sometimes yes. be problematic. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And you're, you're, you're your own boss. I you absolutely agree. Yeah. Building that accountability. Yes. Every little thing in the business. Discipline. Yeah. 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 Discipline to get, get it done. Mm. So I, I, my situation was probably slightly different in a way because I do have a business partner, um, Dan. Um, Dan and I were best friends um, before we started the business. We are not best friends now. Okay. Now, we haven't fallen out in any way. Day to day, we get on like a house on fire. But if you imagine the intensity that you go through when you're, you're running a business, I don't know a partnership. I don't know many marriages that have lasted 10 years, 12 years, which is where we are now. Okay. So what happens is we got very much focused on the business and therefore the friendship side kind of just, we just don't want to spend time with one another when we're out of the office anymore. <laughs> it's great. You know, it works really well. Um, we still had that, that issue, but the difference was our isolation was the two of us against the world. What happened immediately, which was fascinating, was all of those amazing contacts that I got from the PlayStation um, days had disappeared. I was no longer Mr. Corporate Man with a big corporate budget to spend. I was just another chancellor who was desperate to make something work and was going to use anything that I could do to get there. So therefore, they wanted nothing to do with me whatsoever. So that isolation hit us as a unit of two rather than a unit of one, which I think was a major benefit because we could talk about it to each other, which is great because it makes you feel better, but it doesn't actually help with that isolation or, or whatever else that was there. What we did was we created structure. So each day was structured into what we felt we needed to get done on that certain time frame. And by having that structure, and literally as simple as the cross-off boards that everybody uses, um, then for us, that's what created that process. But we had a very structured approach to what we needed to do. So we had 
business set uh, no we didn't we had six months of research that needed to be get done and we knew that we were going to get no money whatsoever until we got that done properly we then had presenting to the bank so we presented this to the bank just after Lehman's um, went down in 2008. And the bank said, we'll loan you money. And we were like, my God, they'll loan us money just after Lehman's has, uh, has collapsed. And at that point, we went, thank you very much. We don't need your money. It was our test to work out, OK, we've done that first stage really, really well. So the structure then went to, OK, so we've now got the money. We've done the research. Um, so we need to be up and running with the brand. So to be up and running with the brand, we need to A, create it. We secondly need to physically get that onto the vehicle's concern. We need to recruit the individuals. So ours was really, really structured, and it always has been in the way we approach it. You mentioned something that's fascinating, which is back in our day, there wasn't any of the support structures that there are now. It's wonderful having all these support structures and knowing on the internet how you get licensed in Dubai, for instance. We have none of that, without a doubt. But it then comes at all this too much information that you don't know which way you're going to go. The way that we deal with that now, because we're constantly researching for whatever the next product's going to be, whatever the next business is going to be, is we read and then we put it away and then we write down what we think we've read and is relevant to us. So at that point, you've interpreted. You haven't just listened. You've interpreted and you've adapted to what you need. That way, you're only taking out the pertinent points that you remember rather than everything that you think you're supposed to be doing. Discard all the rest. It is just there with too much detail to be involved. The other thing that I do constantly is my attention span normally, thank you by the way for managing more than me, is about 10 to 12 minutes. Everybody who I work with now knows if you go past 12 minutes, I'm not gonna walk out, but I will start doing something different. So if you want my time, if you're trying to sell me something, or alternatively, you've got something within the business you need to discuss with me, you've got 10 to 12 minutes. And at that point, I'm just gone. Stick to that from your own perspective, and that will create your productivity, in my view. Okay? Good luck. <laughs> I'm sure there are more questions, but I know that you've all got places to go. And if you Great. do have something you want to come and chat to Colin, you can come up and, and flag him. But we do need to let you all go, and that means, Rhonda, you're up. Thank Lovely. you. Not at all. Thank you, really.